I'm proud and honored to present Benjamin Worf, who's going to give us a talk on the growing brains, how adapting to Africa advanced to the treatment of infant hydrocephalus. Dr. Worf. Thanks very much. Let's see. There we go. Well, um, I just want to take a few minutes to introduce the context of this work, and I'm going to wind up uh, sharing with you some preliminary data on a, a randomized prospective trial that we're doing. About, uh, about 16 years ago, my family and I moved to Uganda uh, to help uh, an organization called Cure International, which is a Christian medical mission organization, start a pediatric neurosurgery hospital in eastern Uganda. And we were quickly overwhelmed by the numbers of children that we were seeing, babies, with hydrocephalus. Currently, my colleagues there, uh, uh, who are still working very hard, treat uh, more than 800 new infant cases of hydrocephalus per year. And we had shown that uh, about 60% of our first 1,000 cases were post-infectious hydrocephalus. These are infections occurring mostly in the neonatal period, causing a ventriculitis. We showed that the infections cycled very closely with the rainfall pattern uh, over the years. And if you take post-infectious hydrocephalus and neural tube defects, that accounts for 75% of the cases of infant hydrocephalus. And uh, our colleague Leland Albright, during his time uh, in Kenya, uh, found the same thing. Of course, treating infant hydrocephalus with shunts is the standard uh, procedure. But this is particularly problematic for kids in rural sub-Saharan Africa. Shunts, of course, fail, and we happen to be in an environment where we can manage that safely. But for children that can't get to treatment quickly, um, shunt dependence is a life-threatening um, condition. We did show that uh, um, in a couple of different studies, when we compared a cheap $35 Indian-made shunt with a couple of North American-based shunt products that one could use a very inexpensive shunt system to treat hydrocephalus with the same uh, one-year failure and infection rates. But of course, that didn't eliminate the problems of shunt dependence. In about 2001, we had the opportunity to begin performing endoscopic third ventriculostomy as a primary a treatment in these infants. And uh, we found, as have others, that for children under a year of age, and particularly under six months of age, ETV wasn't very effective and the failure rates were pretty high. Which is too bad, because the failure rates for ETV and shunts are quite different. Uh, this is a graph uh, from work by Ab Kulkarni and colleagues, looking at the shunt versus ETV failure rate patterns. And they showed that by two and a half years, more shunts will have failed than ETVs. By three months, the risk of shunt failure is greater, and most failures occur within six months. Now, when you're treating mostly infant hydrocephalus, this is an important difference, because ETV failure will, will occur in these children in what you might call the safe zone, because the cranium is compliant and treatment a failure is a visible diagnosis, and it's not an emergency. Children have time to get back for treatment. Later on, when shunts are failing, uh, failure is a, more of an emergency. And so we really wanted to find a way to make ETV successful for more infants. So we took an abandoned, relatively abandoned, historical treatment of endoscopic choroid <coughs> plexus cauterization, cauterizing the plexus in both lateral ventricles through a single frontal approach, and added that at the same operation to the ETV. What we showed was that the combined procedure, you can see in the left blue and red bars there, the, the blue bar being ETV alone and the red bar being the combined procedure, there was a statistically significant increase in effectiveness by adding the CPC. This was the case across all etiologies of hydrocephalus. It made the, the least difference in the post-infectious group. It made the most difference in the myelomeningocele, the MM there on the, the graph, basically doubling the success rate for endoscopic treatment of hydrocephalus in children with spina bifida with a 75% success rate. 
For post-infectious hydrocephalus, we had shown that slightly less than a third of those children had a badly scarred prepontine cistern. And uh, on the left, you see a nice clean prepontine cistern with the basilar artery and the sixth nerve heading into the cavernous sinus there, and uh, down below, a scarred prepontine cistern. And we found that with that picture, the rate of treatment failure was double. And so we developed the uh, treatment paradigm of shunting those children when the ETV was done and a bad, badly scarred cistern was found because the failure rate there was so high. We looked at uh, treatment uh, success in other etiologies of hydrocephalus, uh, and uh, we were able to avoid shunt uh, dependence in the majority, even in cases of congenital so-called communicating idiopathic hydrocephalus. So how might CPC enhance the success for ETV in infants? According to uh, the more traditional and older bulk flow model, which we've been using for almost 100 years now, ETV would bypass an obstruction, and it might not be as effective in infants because infants uh, have a reduced capacity for CSF absorption. Their arachnoid granulations aren't yet fully developed. And so CPC might reduce the CSF production rate. There's an alternate model for hydrocephalus and CSF physiology uh, that some have called the hydrodynamic model, and it may be that ETV adds a pulsation absorber which reduces the amplitude of intraventricular pulsations, which are necessary for enlarging the ventricles in that model. Infants have more compliant brains. Their ventricles are more easily distended. And so to make that more effective, CPC may actually reduce the pulsation driver in the ventricular system. However it works, we have been able to avoid shunts in about two out of three babies under a year of age that present for treatment to cure a children's Hospital of Uganda. Because of the large volume of patients we have, we've been able to effectively answer some specific questions. First of all, is this a safe operation? Our infection and operative mortality rates are less than 1%. We wondered whether a failed ETV CPC or an abandoned procedure, uh, which converting to shunt, whether either of those scenarios would increase the risk of shunt failure or infection for children that ultimately required a shunt. The answer to that was no. In fact, those treated endoscopically seemed to have a slight advantage, although this wasn't statistically significant. So we were comfortable with that. And we showed that for treatment failures that were the result of ETV closure, reopening of the ETV rather than placing a shunt was an effective and durable treatment, particularly for children that failed more than three months postoperatively. But there was one nagging question, and that was that Shunts do produce smaller ventricles in children with hydrocephalus than does endoscopic treatment. And we were concerned that shunts might be better than ETV CPC for brain development in young infants. Our first attempt to answer this question was in a retrospective study in children with spina bifida, comparing those that had not required treatment for hydrocephalus on the left there with the blue arrows to those who had required shunting for hydrocephalus, the red arrows, to those with the green arrows there um, that had been treated successfully by ETV CPC. And what we showed in these different subcategories of the Bailey scales of infant development was that there was, uh, there was no difference in the mean uh, normed uh, scores in these different subcategories between shunted patients and those treated endoscopically. With the help of my friend and colleague Steve Schiff at Penn State and also Ab Kulkarni at University of Toronto, we took that same cohort of patients and looked at the relationship between brain volume and CSF volume, uh, that relationship to their developmental scores, and found that brain volume actually correlated better than CSF volume for developmental outcome, but that brain volume did not correlate with the type of treatment. So that brings us to our current uh, study. This is a study uh, funded by the NIH entitled Neurocognitive Outcomes and Changes in Brain and CSF Volume After Treatment of Post-Infectious Hydrocephalus in Ugandan Infants by Shunting versus ETV CPC. Now, in picking this group of patients, these are not great candidates for ETV-CPC. They're, they're some of the lower 
uh, scoring candidates in regard to likelihood of success because of the very young age in the post-infectious etiology. Our co-investigators uh, in this project are Steve Schiff at Penn State, Ab Kolkarni at University of Toronto, and Dr. Edith Mbabazi at Cure Uganda. Inclusion criteria are children less than six months of age, those that meet a rather rigorous algorithm for making the diagnosis of post-infectious hydrocephalus. The mother has to be at least 18 years of age, and they have to res reside in one of the districts that are in southeastern Uganda, just around our hospital. The reason for that is that's in proximity to our hospital, and we had shown in those districts that there was no difference in five-year survival between patients treated by shunt or ETV CPC uh, for either PIH or myelomeningocele. So we had uh, equipoise for doing that. Patients were randomized to intention to treat by shunt or ETV CPC. The primary outcome measure is the Bailey Scales of Infant Development cognitive score. Secondary outcome measures are the BSID subscores, age normed brain and CSF volumes, morbidity and mortality, and treatment failure. Children must be candidates for either procedure uh, to be enrolled. So in the CT scan in the upper right-hand corner, that patient would not qualify for entrance into the study. Um, the anatomic distortion there from the ventriculitis and cerebritis makes it so that ETV would likely be a technical failure. Likewise, straightforward shunting would also not be a good solution here. One would want to endoscopically fenestrate the septations to allow uh, a shunt to work. The lower CT scan there is an example of a patient that qualified for the study. And then those that are found at the time of ETV to have a scarred prepontine cistern will, according to our usual protocol, cross over to shunt as their treatment. So far, we have screened 158 patients and enrolled 100, which was the goal. Uh, the majority have had their uh, one year uh, data collected, and uh, um, about 20 now have had their, uh, one, their two year data collected. 51 patients randomized to ETV CPC and 49 randomized to uh, shunt, and in the blue boxes there you can see the crossovers. There were nine crossover patients that were found to have a scarred cistern, and they crossed over to shunt treatment. There, have been no, there were no operative mortalities, death by any cause within 30 days. There were 10 deaths so far. Uh, all of those uh, were several months after surgery. And the cause of death was malnutrition in three, acute gastroenteritis uh, in three, and uh, pneumonia and measles. This is what happens to children in developing countries. Two of the patients have died likely from hydrocephalus or treatment-related causes. One of them had a shunt infection at five and a half months post-op and uh, one of them failed to come back when uh, signs of elevated intracranial pressure became a problem. So far, uh, these are our results at one year. Um, there's no difference in the 12-month treatment failure rate. You can see that the red line there on the bottom are the ETV CPC patients, and all of the failures have occurred in less than three months during the so-called safe zone. Shunts continued to fail in the blue line on the top, and by one year, there's no statistically significant difference uh, in, uh, treatment, uh, in treatment failure. This was the same for the as-treated as for the intention to treat groups. In looking at the six-month brain and CSF volumes, um, as one might expect, shunts did a much better job of reducing the ventricles. In fact, there was a 60% average decrease in CSF volume between pre-op and six months post-op, whereas for the ETV CPC treated group, there's actually a slight 15% increase in CSF volume from pre-op to post-op. But in regard to brain volume, both had an increase, an average increase in brain volume of 71%. And in regard to the developmental scores at 12 months, there's no difference between the two treatment groups, except for the one circled there in the intention to treat uh, uh, groups, where the endoscopically treated patients had a significantly increased uh, score in the gross motor uh, subscore. 
which didn't bear out in the as-treated groups. So the conclusions to date, and this is a study that will be completed after two years of follow-up on all these parameters, there's no difference in survival at one year, there's no difference in brain growth at one year, um, there's no difference in development, and there's no difference in failure at one year, although the ETV-CPC failures occur during this safe zone, whereas shunt failures continue to occur. We've been training neurosurgeons from developing countries to do this over the last number of years. We've so far trained 27 surgeons in 18 countries. We supply them with the endoscopy equipment. We provide maintenance and replacement on those things. We um, provide a locally hired cure hydrocephalus clinical coordinator to help with patient follow-up. Since 2001, we've treated more than 18,000 children for hydrocephalus. Bringing this uh, to Boston in 2009, you can see that over the course of uh, the years since this was implemented, the numbers of shunts that we place in children less than one year of age, the red line has decreased um, noticeably. And it's been my privilege to bring a number of North American pediatric neurosurgeons, mostly those in the hydrocephalus clinical research uh, network, to be trained in the technique in Uganda, uh, as well as our Boston Children's Hospital pediatric neurosurgery fellows. And these are the people that will determine uh, whether this is uh, uh, an appropriate treatment for children uh, in North America. I want to thank people that have contributed to this work, mostly my family, donors, Cure International, my co-investigators, the National Institutes of Health and the Fogarty Institute, USAID, and the MacArthur Foundation. Thank you very much.